So just to welcome all viewers and listeners to this uh, beginning of this last module of four, where I intend to uh, present the empirical results of my own research from the cooperative economy towards a stakeholder-led democracy. And in fact, these are, uh, this is the research from chapters 9, 10, and 11. I have done a little bit of something in this uh, transformation to multimedia format. So I have uh, for the moment left out chapter 9. So I begin here with chapter 10, case studies in cooperative microeconomics. And um, so just would like to get immediately into some of the empirical research that I've conducted. At the end of chapter 11, I would like to return uh, to the uh, points that are made in chapter 9, which basically set out a research agenda and suggest some methods that uh, future researchers, including myself, can apply to studying the cooperative economy. And instead of starting with that, I'd like to end with that. So basically to give listeners and viewers uh, just an overview of my application of these methods towards these agendas. I think it's a bit better uh, to, to do it this way, especially in this medium. Uh, of course, yeah, reading and watching and listening are different formats and they require a different approach. So just to begin, um, this chapter I do draw on, uh, which is chapter 10, um, and in this set of videos I will be drawing uh, on the theories that I have developed in uh, the prior module, module 3, and in particular in the middle of that, in that module that has uh, been described as, or that those videos that have been labeled as cooperative microeconomics, I think that's about video three, two or three, three or four in module three. And you can review those if you have further questions or uh, would like some more background as to the theoretical architecture that I apply in this uh, research agenda. So uh, I do draw on that research to develop a concrete research program for extending knowledge as well as uh, for providing confirming or disconfirming evidence for the theses that are developed, uh, that have been developed in the course of this research that I've laid out in the past uh, three modules. Uh, while the uh, next actual set of videos that derive from chapter 11 will actually develop frameworks applying uh, the research agenda of the last uh, set of videos in module three, which are, is the ecological framework in case studies uh, in the form of missions. This uh, set of uh, videos and uh, uh, lectures outlines the basically criteria and parameters as well as setting up outlines of particular case studies to derive knowledge in the two primary domains of democratic choice and inalienable hierarchy respectively. And those are concepts of course that I've discussed throughout these lectures. So just to get to this uh, first research strand which uh, discusses contingent preference development and cooperative education. Uh, as has been argued throughout these lectures, democracy can be seen as a progressive ideal, which aspires to relationalize ever more aspects of social activity in a recursive process of developing suitable moral competence and self-efficacy uh, in citizens or members through a process of relationalizing labor within and between organizations. So we've seen and heard uh, people like Hegel speaking of the dialectical turn of traditional labor relations, which while lodged in a master-slave logic, nevertheless present the laborer with opportunities for learning. And as we also learned, this process of social learning takes place dynamically during or despite the authoritarianism uh, in, involved in uh, productive relations. Uh, Piaget, the famed uh, um, um, psychologist, speaks of a tendency from heteronomy towards autonomy, again, a dynamic process, thus facilitating a progressive shift in both material relations and a civic imaginary in the language of Cornelius Castoriadis. So this, of course, this development can occur fortuitously and sporadically uh, through these types of variations in organizational structures from place to place and time to time, but uh, it can also be cultivated explicitly 
Thus, numerous economic actors have recognized the benefit to a well-educated and morally competent workforce and citizenry, and so interest has grown as to the potential for distributed leadership and more broad dissemination of leadership skills generally. The prior videos have outlined numerous milestones in this tradition, and in this context below, I do provide a case study of a potential manifestation of a cooperative integral helix in the form of uh, Lein, which is a, a bachelor's degree in business administration, leadership, and innovation. It's, it's an abbreviation that operates in international network and international network of campuses or campi, uh, it's a Latin word, and provides a cooperative alternative to an entrepreneurial degree. So I do present these uh, results now. Uh, so first of all, Traveling University, I should introduce uh, listeners and viewers, is a project that was developed jointly by the Spanish Education and Consultancy Cooperative, TEC Base, which actually means uh, if we don't do it, then who will? Uh, and uh, Mondragon Team Academy, as well as Mondragon University. It has since, uh, of course, which is associated with the collective of, of cooperatives in the Basque region in the north of, of Spain, uh, has uh, since uh, September 2016 offered a bachelor's degree in leadership and innovation. The program is dubbed the official European bachelor's degree in Europe, uh, entrepreneurial leadership and innovation and has seen a roughly 2,500 student entrepreneurs from 29 nationalities with 30 startups being developed in that time. Uh, the structure of the program is partly modeled on the so-called rocket model that was first developed by the Finnish Timi Academia, a team academy, a business school without teachers, lectures, or exams. Appropriating this model, TZBZ, MTA, and the Mondragon University have developed a derivative called the Falcon model, which places emphasis on three skill areas, a foundational basis in legal, financial, and technical, as well as digital skills, a second basis in community uh, and individual skills like individual learning, empathy, and friendship, and a third basis in explicitly practical entrepreneurial skills. Similar to the structure of the Finnish model, the uh, distinction between teacher and student is formally eliminated in the program. Instead of professors, Lein features uh, team coaches, and instead of students, the program features teampreneurs. Uh, a combination of team and entrepreneur, which is to emphasize the collective process of value creation. The idea of the program, which is organized into four years, is to give uh, teampreneurs the opportunity to develop and scale the values outlined in what I've just suggested in an international practice oriented setting, in which the first year uh, traditionally has been spent in Bilbao the second in Berlin, and the third being split between South Korea and China, the fourth uh, spent establishing a startup, although that structure is currently undergoing reform. As part of the curriculum, leadership skills are ideally developed, and in particular, the idea is to achieve a balance, uh, as has been suggested, between different aspects, such as individual versus team skills. In order to achieve this balance and to develop suitable skills, projects and curriculum are organized into both modules, as well as universes, uh, such as the three skill areas that I have outlined just a moment ago, each of which intends to facilitate one or more professional and personal value. The program is actually based on self-evaluation and responsibilities are in fact split between team coaches and teampreneurs themselves. The program features a learning compass, which exists in both a team and individual version and which facilitates the self-evaluation process. Um, to move on to some of the uh, self-evaluations of the um, student and alumni, which I find more interesting than sort of this boilerplate issues, of course, it's also important to have some basic backgrounds. The uh, program, and of course, this uh, was uh, research was conducted on a, an on-site uh, visit to the Berlin uh, campus uh, of uh, the program. The program, in fact, is in many ways geared towards a particular audience and just viewing its website and promotional material presents the program using words like revolutionary and future oriented, mentioning notions like becoming a world citizen and promoting the connection to firm or enterprise foundation. 
Moreover, there seems to be a process of self-selection. Thus, both alumni as well as current students expressed in interviews the desire to find new forms of entrepreneurship or describe dissatisfaction with, for instance, as one uh, respondent said it, doubts about the business world. The sense that the program breaks with traditional university education appeared widely shared uh, amongst the students and alumni. A normal business school makes entrepreneurial activities difficult was one of the statements by a respondent due to its focus on theoretical matters and frequent failure to connect theory with implementation. Aritz, a musician and second year participant in the program suggested that having or being a member of two bands, he uh, was an entrepreneur all along, but was originally not interested in the concept of entrepreneurship. To, to Aritz, uh, the program offered interesting ways of engaging in entrepreneurship and led to a change in mindset on the part of Aritz. Alberto, a computer scientist and second year participant, suggested he learned many new things and ways of doing business. He also alluded to the program's attention to the non-standard and darker side of business, for instance, the critical view towards ecological degradation, as an example, as traditionally taught in business schools and remarked that he had come to appreciate different qualities or types of business. These observations can be considered evidence for a relational logic at work where the social values and constraints inherent in the cooperative principles as propensities translate into a unique manifestation of an entrepreneurial logic as outlined in um, the critical view of, Schum of the critical perspective on Schumpeter's view of entrepreneurship in module two. As regards the potential for enlarging the domain of democratic collective choice, uh, as was expressed both by teampreneurs and team coaches, there is a significant attrition in the program, which for instance, one of the uh, uh, alumni Miguel described as driving from people assuming, so to speak, delivery of entrepreneurship and because of a failure to act during the business phase, i.e. the final year of the bachelor, which is dedicated to the entrepreneurial phase where participants are actually expected to develop their startup. Moreover, Miguel is uh, convinced that uh, the average age of inductees, uh, first year participants of 18 to 21, many are not mentally mature, while at the same time, mental maturity is important for the degree. This again speaks of the importance of moral competence for leadership generally, and particularly a broad-based moral competence in an environment where teamwork is emphasized, such as at Lein. It could be argued that the traditional interpretation of translative hierarchy, now this is the uh, concessional hierarchy that I mentioned is represented by representative uh, elections, as practiced in the labor market generally, uh, inhibits the development of such a competence due to its focus on pr principal agent contracting and the contradictory opposition of de facto responsibility with the you're pretending to be part-time robots in the language of David Edelman. This scenario, if true, can partly contribute to the self-selection that apparently occurs during the early stages of induction at Lein. Experiments on, in relational governance and uh, the innovative use of uh, democratic choice mechanisms like consensus and or sortition could provide an impetus to prevent or at least reduce attrition in the early stages of the program. By introducing a strong foundation for a regime of discourse ethics with its typology of consensus and its logic of discourse, many of those lacking a high degree of self-efficacy could learn in ways that can iteratively raise their estimation of their ability to achieve critical milestones. The view that I have presented in prior videos and modules would argue for such a thesis. Uh, I unfortunately was not able to carry out such an experiment at the in due to time constraints. I would have liked to have done so and to see the results that such a, uh, a uh, for instance, rotation or sortition based selection of team captains within these uh, within these different teams could have uh, uh, encouraged uh, within the different students and if that would have had a significant uh, effect on the attrition rate. However, Lein is one organization, uh, one of the challenges uh, that it faces is a perceived high attrition rate, as I've mentioned in the program. Could be argued that one of the mediating factors motivating people to leave the program is a misalignment in their sense of self-efficacy 
combined with the expectations the program imposes on them. Thus, whereas the program requires a high degree of self-management on the part of uh, teampreneurs, many may not have acquired these skills in the past and are unable or believe themselves, and more importantly, to be unable to acquire them autonomously. This may lead to a situation, as described by Andrew Van Duer, where a negative feedback loop occurs. Another organization uh, that uh, has perhaps a similar environment is VME, which I will profile in actually the next uh, set of lectures that profile chapter 11. Uh, it is uh, actually the result, VME is the result of a conversion from a traditional business with a, a coercive a choice mechanism. And as I will discuss uh, in those videos later on, one of the challenges facing VME is stimulating worker engagement and changing the company culture from one where workers are decision takers to decision makers. This again appears to be an issue of dislodging a static situation where in the past workers have had their self-efficacy stymied and therefore often possibly falsely estimate their own capacities at self-governance to be quite low. In both of these organizational settings, there is a chicken and egg problem that is not easily solved from a static perspective. Thus, uh, I have in these prior videos developed a dynamic perspective that views organizations as anticipatory systems. According to this perspective, the conversion from a coercive to democratic choice uh, mechanism frequently must occur at a constrained level, i.e., or for instance, by implementing democratic choice mechanisms in limited functions within an organization, or over to render static or habitual social relations more dynamic, a mix of such mechanisms may be desirable. Thus, in the case of the in, where the attrition rate appears higher towards the program start, it may behoove the integrity of inductees to assign leadership roles by lot in the first year, where knowledge of the capacities of individual teampreneurs may not be known to their colleagues and may not be known to themselves rendering any type of elections uh, meaningless. Similarly, introducing consensual structures in VME sociocratic circles may contribute to a dynamic increase in the capacities of stakeholders who are made to learn through practice new habits and routines. VME may also wish to experiment with allocating leadership positions within the circles by lot and combining this with a notion of shared responsibility. This would at the same time give stakeholders opportunities to surprise themselves by discovering new skill sets and at the same time remove some of the pressures on individuals imbuing leadership with the relational qualities uh, that I've spelled out in prior lectures. In each of these hypothetical cases, the point would be to shift contingent preference development away from a principal agent framework and its legacy master slave logic to a framework of shared agency with a logic of discourse. If such a shift entails a chicken and egg problem, the point is that governance innovations like employing democratic choice mechanism mixes can help break out of the routines and habits people have formed. Uh, while some of these routines may be desirable and beneficial, many may exist merely as formal or informal conventions that once their utility or efficacy is established within the new governance mix can be retained. The point is, however, to challenge routinized thinking and organizational inertia which may include elements of prejudice and self-doubt uh, that may themselves be unfounded. Developing structured knowledge as to the efficacy of innovative governance structures is thus a desirable outcome in order to develop systematic tools to translate the notions discussed in preceding uh, videos and modules into tools that organizations can easily implement in order to relationalize their governance structures. And on the left, of course, you see one of the cohorts of uh, graduates of the Nein program of Traveling University. The second research strand uh, I refer to as implications of relational governance. And in fact, returning to the consequences and promises of membership in organizations, one of the important themes that has recurred throughout all of these lectures recall the discussion in uh, module two on membership to the Greek polis as a central factor in the creation of the civic consciousness. Uh, they're referred to as the macro culture. So I do wish at present to move towards uh, testing the hypothesis that shifts in membership of an organization employing workers towards increasing strategic control on the part of uh, workers has a positive impact on a number of factors related to intrinsic motivation and association with an organization. As such, to recall, uh, assume the organization has aims besides the maximization of profit, subject to constraints, 
and attribute to it instead the goal of balancing amongst a number of different rationality profiles repeated to the differing interests of the respective classes uh, or stakeholders. It is thus uh, my belief that such increased strategic control on the part of workers uh, provides these with a voice within an organization and also enhances their credibility inside the employment relation. At the same time, such a change should also impact the perceived legitimacy of decisions within the organization. Thus, whether in quantitative studies, such as those that I will quickly allude to at the end of these, this last module, or in the qualitative research that has been featured and will be featured in the remainder of uh, this and the next uh, chapter and in the most of this module, uh, I am performing a surgery, to use the language of uh, Judea Pearl, on the parameter of employment status to test the impact of change on membership uh, structure in otherwise comparable organizations. This notion of surgery is borrowed from Judea Pearl, as I've already suggested, and I have chosen supermarkets uh, both for their ubiquity and for the public nature of the labor that transpires there. Similar to Isabel Ferreras, I do believe that the nature of work has shifted uh, and does shift when it is done in what may reasonably be compared with the public sphere. And this is the case in the service sector. Uh, supermarkets, of course, have been chosen uh, by myself because of their similar arrangements in all matters, say, for the status of ownership and strategic control within the enterprise. On to just to describe, to describe the case studies on one extreme end, we have uh, Rewe, which is a retailer-owned chain of German supermarkets. Next, there is, is uh, a number of consumer cooperatives, including Green Star and Eroski. And rounding it off is Centro Olimpio, which is a supermarket in Palermo, organized actually as a worker cooperative. Uh, by way of qualitative interviews, I, I just attempted to discover whether a significant difference existed in a number of indicators that I proposed as proxies for the interests being balanced in an organization. For instance, I uh, have discovered that workers in supermarkets, or rather it's a um, hypothetical question, if I did discover that workers in supermarkets with more representation of workers on the board are happier uh, but uh, perhaps then they fail financially. This would be an argument actually for uh, the fact that if supermarkets are, des are desirable, then they should be organized according to instrumental rationality uh, of dominium or of translative hierarchy. Again, just a hypothetical. However, if I were to discover significant improvements in worker welfare at low cost or no cost, either to firm survival or long-term stability, then that may in fact be an argument for adopting further employee representation generally in supermarkets. In particular, it is my belief that such an increased strategic control provides workers with voice, as I've already said, within organizations and also enhances their credibility. Um, and it, uh, yeah, so basically to get, to get into the uh, actual case studies, I think these are very interesting. The first one uh, is Rewe which is a service or retailer cooperative where individual franchisees are members. It was founded in 1927 as the Revisionsverband der Westkaufgenossenschaften, uh, servicing to, uh, rather serving to facilitate purchases between different grocers, and is today the second largest grocery retailer in Germany. Its practices have been scrutinized in recent years and frequently has been described as not in keeping with the cooperative principles. Civil suits in recent years have also damaged its reputation. It has recently begun a large-scale campaign of selling off its stores to local franchises. Sladjana Nikolic works in a Rewe in Frankfurt. She has uh, worked for Rewe since 2010, beginning uh, first at the discount subsidiary Penny, where she worked for three years and then moved on to Rewe, where she got better hours. While Penny, um, this Penny store had less workers, uh, there were 10, her Rewe colleagues number around 60. There is in general a feeling of being appreciated. If one does one's job right, then one is treated with respect. In terms of treatment by his clients, between 10 and 20% are unfriendly. Slatyana comments that she finds such treatment awful, but doesn't let it get to her, but that her daughter who worked for Rewe part-time some years ago at night on weekends could not take it. She's generally satisfied and does not feel surveilled, although others do. 
There have been some cases of workers stealing merchandise. She relates well with her colleagues and his friends or acquaintances with around 50% of them who meet each other re regularly, for instance, for coffee. Contact to the bosses is always difficult as they frequently change after two years. She's never had a leadership position and wouldn't take one because there's no pay difference uh, and she has no college degree. She feels like part of the team and in many ways like a family. One of the problems on the horizon is that Rebe is selling 80% of its locations to private individuals, including the franchise where she works. The work conditions will certainly be worse after the store is sold, and as the new owner is only required to keep existing work contracts and other conditions for one year after the sale. This process began five or six years ago. It will be difficult to find a non-privatized Rebe to work in, and even the franchise she was interested in working in after the sale is going to be sold. The workers are not asked for their input on such sales and usually find out one month in advance. Many of her colleagues will not be taken on at one of the new privatized stores, as the new owners prefer those who have been working uh, less time, as they get paid less, meaning a form of lilo, last in, last out, in accountancy terminology. Moreover, the private owners do not provide the same vacation pay or public transit passes. Slatyana knows of a case where a colleague was working in a kiosk associated with her Eva branch and had to use the bathroom, leaving his station unattended to do so. The manager chewed out the colleague in front of the store, in front of clients and everyone. The incident led to an investigation at the branch manager's office where employees were questioned about the incident. Slatyana was asked how she had the courage to tell the manager that his behavior was not acceptable. She responded at the time that she feared no one and she suggested that there were colleagues who were more shy and unwilling to speak out in such cases, but that someone else almost always takes them under their wing. There are also some people who exploit the labor law protections using sick leaves, etc. She says of the job, I, would, I could always earn more elsewhere like Aldi, but work has to be enjoyable. Uh, secondly, the Green Star Cooperative, which is uh, a consumer cooperative in Ithaca, New York, with roots in the environmental and anti-war movement in the late 1960s and 70s. It was founded in 1971. Its original members were the town's leftists, vegetarians, and anti-war movement against the Vietnam War, as well as the Back to the Land movement, as well as Quakers. The store began on a pre-order format, meaning members purchased together in bulk. At one point, a store was opened in a basement, which provided more convenience, that is, without the need to pre-order. Tensions arose between the pre-order system and the store system. Around 1980, there was a split with most members going to the store. The pre-order system died out a few years later. Membership at the store increased quite significantly. People liked the convenience of not having to pre-order, according to Dan Hoffman, a board member at Green Star. Changes happened as a result of the change in size of the store. The cooperative took on consultancy opinions from a firm that is today called Caluminate. Uh, there was a change to a translative hierarchical structure with a general manager at the top. In recent years, Green Star has actually experienced significant attrition of active members, leading to financial difficulties and occasional labor conflict. At the same time, a crisis of liquidity has threatened the sustainability of the cooperative. Meanwhile, its new members include young leftists, homeschoolers, and Bernie Sanders supporters, according to one member, as well as college students and University of Ithaca uh, students and types, employees and spouses. According to Mary White, many university types go to Wegmans, a local chain, and get the hell home. For the middle classes, there's also tops. Thus, members have perceived a change in culture. According to Ed Swayze, the cooperative has responded by adopting a corporate model which is not working. Uh, Ed is also a member of the board. Uh, as Stan Hoffman has argued, since the pandemic, management is much more focused on economic survival than anything else. In part, Mary suggests that the conflict is one between old line radicals and so-called realists, the latter of whom have resisted, for instance, unionizing efforts on the part of workers, managers hire and fire at will, as it currently stands, and there is no membership influence on staffing. The corporate model includes hiring more business school degree managers, according to Mary White, who have worked to, to eliminate legacy routines like having members' children volunteering, a common practice in the past. According to several members, under the new managerial style, there has been less vol volunteering in general. 
Mary is getting less interested in voting and has in the past resigned her membership, but renewed it due to economic necessity or self-interest. In many ways, as mentioned, the board is concerned with the bottom line. Several members have complained about the difficulties in introducing waste reduction approaches and lamenting a general lack of innovation and energy. Members have also lamented the changes in inventory and membership classes. Thus, the cooperative no longer offers family membership, only individual memberships, leading to most customers feeling fairly anonymous. At the same time, in terms of the selection, there is now a huge amount of junk food, as Mary White put it, or a huge amount of packaged convenience food, lots of shiny plastics, as Yayoi Kazumi put it. As mentioned, there have been multiple labor disputes in recent years, worsened by the pandemic. This included layoffs of a number of longtime staff and resulted in at least one lawsuit with the National Labor Relations Board. One female worker who stayed, started originally as a super worker, that is another name for volunteer consumer members who receive additional food uh, discount on purchases based on their work in the store, suggested that there were changes in, in it becoming more and more of a hierarchy. It was feeling less like a community, less like everyone had a lot, to, a lot of say and more like higher ups were those who were ultimately making choices. Moreover, this worker who currently still works at Green Star suggested that they, these changes occurred between 2012 and 2015 and followed the first firing. After this point, the worker pointed out that it seemed like we were suddenly getting hires uh, that came from a different place, that is not people who shop at Green Star. They weren't people I'd ever seen there before. They were hired for specific jobs, said this worker. Moreover, after this member returned to work after a pandemic-induced layoff, the store this member returned to was not the same, including reforms that apparently uh, other co-ops had, uh, had, had had. For instance, a central store manager asked whether management encouraged existing workers to apply for such managerial positions. The worker responded, they did welcome internal applications and a couple of workers did apply, but they did not get the job. It ended up being someone from the outside who was not at all familiar with the co-op who never shopped at Green Star, and not surprisingly, it didn't work out. I don't think she lasted six months, this member said. Thus, the work environment has changed such that many people get hired who haven't shopped at Green Star, and they see it as a, just a job, and they're not shopping there, and it's not a way of life for them. When asked how the work environment was originally, this member suggested that originally everyone took ownership for their job, it felt like everyone was empowered at the job they were doing, such that everyone was working in their own unique way and knew what their strengths were. And they were supported as individuals. Speaking about the environment in the store prior to the rationalization, this worker said, we had a lot of crazy times. For instance, we played all kinds of music and the occasional food fight and craziness, but we were like this big family. Asked to speak more about the nature of super workers, that is volunteers, this worker recalled that what we called super workers haven't been able to come since the pandemic, and that changes a lot to, uh, to not have that. I mean, not only are we understaffed and not doing well financially, so we would benefit from that labor and that sense of community again. It would be great. I knew we used to even have super workers that gave massages, and that was amazing. I felt so blessed thinking how many jobs do you have for on your 15 minute breaks you get to go to get a massage where they give two hours of massages and get a discount for the month on their food. And I thought that was great. When asked whether this worker had given up hope, the worker responded, no, no, I haven't, because I think sometimes that even if it folds, that is, goes out of business, I feel like this town is going to want something else like Green Star. Sometimes things fail and are rebuilt. So that's a possibility. But hopefully it won't go that far and people just realize that it hasn't been working the way we're trying to do it. Asked what could improve, uh, the present situation, the worker suggested that one, one thing that I think would really help us right now is to have more member labor again, as since the pandemic, we have not had member labor. She's speaking of volunteer labor here. The worker continued, if council was more staff oriented, I think that would probably be a good thing. Either if staff members were in council or council was asking us more questions now and getting involved with us more. Thirdly, I would like to talk about Iroski which is the second largest supermarket chain in Spain. Eroski is a multi-stakeholder cooperative with 50% representation of workers, 50% of clients. Uh, it has engaged in a cooperative development program entitled Cooperativismo, 
and can thus provide an additional specific case study on cooperative education. Fran and Iroski member described Iroski as a futuristic model for Spain, un modelo futuro, as there are not many supermarkets in the country, more small stores. Iroski decided to organize into a larger entity. Iroski has two classes of members, consumers and workers. In total, there are more consumers than workers. In terms of culture, Fran suggested that it was described by entra sin llamar, enter without knocking, so a very liberal culture. The structure is similar to other Mondragon co cooperatives with a general assembly, that this is the largest assembly with representative uh, group of, for the 8,000 worker members. The assembly comprises 50% representatives of workers, 50% of clients. One point of argument is that workers carry the larger risk and should therefore potentially have a veto, although these, this is not currently the case. Governance has two pillars, an executive council of 12 persons and a social council, which is just comprised of workers. In addition to this, there's a client council with just customer members. In addition to these, there's also a commission yegada, a delegate commission, which decides individual issues such as purchasing. France suggests that the multi-stakeholder cooperative is, a more complex, is more complex than a worker cooperative, requiring workers to have the same philosophy as the company. There's also a problem of transferring values across generations. In this respect, Fran worked with stakeholder number 92 and has been at Iroski for 21 years. Some years one puts money in, he says, and uh, rather than taking it out, as profits as well as losses are shared. One of the present tasks of the cooperative is the breaking down of barriers between departments, which are oftentimes operating in a cloistered manner, according to Fran. Asked about the impact of multi, the multi-stakeholding model, Fran suggested that it is better to have two types of member classes because you really need consumers. This is the business. Thus, the interest of clients is central for the continuing existence of the going concern. Having the workers be members keeps the money in the cooperative as workers shop there. One on, uh, of the work environment, he said that it feels more comfortable here, like being a public worker, or a, in German, you won't speak of the Amte, an official uh, 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 ministerial uh, employee. Compared to other jobs in the sector, there's less pressure, more holidays, better wages, and so on. The company has different tools to promote competitiveness and is currently working on developing an online platform for sales. One of the problems the company faces is the lack of pay differences. There is no significant difference in remunerations along the hierarchy. For example, the wage differential between a cashier and manager is one to six. And this is a problem, according to Fran. Any reform needs to be mutual and consensual, however. Of his own position, Fran states that he could earn 20 or 25% more elsewhere but I am here because I believe in Eroski. Moreover, he argued that the philosophy appeals to him. It's better to work together because collectively the benefits will be bigger. Cooperativismo, again, was a largely failed project to convert all firms within a group to cooperatives. Franz suggests the problem was risk sharing, socializing losses, as well as the issue of engendering long-term thinking. In particular, the lack of cooperative education is pertinent says Fran. Other parts of Spain don't know what a cooperative is. Also, culture was an issue. People don't learn active involvement in their firm in school. They don't live in an environment conducive to such forms of agency. The program was well planned, but people didn't want it. People just wanted a job, as Fran said. Fran's lesson from the program is that you have to change the mind first, then the business. Regarding the teaching of cooperative values, Fran suggested that education is important as it metaphorically creates the soil on which other values grow. In fact, in recent years, there has been a great effort at expansion, meaning the number of stakeholders has doubled and not all have cooperative values, according to Fran. For many, they get a job like in a regular company. Ultimately, Fran is convinced that if you have a good culture, you have a good company. For him personally, he says, I learned values from member 92 and I can pass the spirit on to others. And important for this process is uh, fluid communication. Lastly, I turn to Centro, Centro Olimpio. While Iroski is a multi-stakeholder cooperative where both consumers and workers are members, owners, Centro Olimpio is a supermarket on the outskirts of Palermo, Sicily, organized as a worker cooperative. 
Centro Olimpio is a special case in that it was formerly owned by the Sicilian Mafia and converted into a worker cooperative partly through a process of expropriation. Thus, it does not fit neatly within the rubric of either a negotiated or class struggle, being a case between these two categories, initiated in part by workers resisting unfair labor practices and in part as a succession facilitated by the state. The store was originally organized as a limited liability company, which was controlled by the Sicilian Mafia. At the time, there was little or no interest in worker welfare, skills development, etc. On the part of the management, uh, there was also a general lack of transparency with respect to bookkeeping and other affairs of both management and operations, according to President Gaetano Salpietro. The legal situation changed in the 2000s when new laws on the expropriation of mafia property were passed or implemented. The dissatisfied workers slowly transformed the firm into a cooperative. This was particularly due to the fact that there were no buyers for, for the supermarket. Together with the CFI in Rome, as CFI in Italy was too weak financially to facilitate, a workers' buyout was promulgated, making use of the Makora law, which I discuss actually in a subsequent video. Thus, together with CFI financing and an equity stake via the Makora law, the process was undertaken and eventually promulgated in 2014. Gaetano Salpietro, the current president of Centro Olimpio, argues that the conversion wouldn't have been possible without outside help. The cooperative has had 34 worker members in 2020, in addition to 22 non-member workers. Gaetano and other members are convinced that the cooperatives have the ability to invest in long-term, not just short-term profit. An understanding of this idea has to develop first, however, and this presents a challenge. This circumstance is exacerbated by the regionalism in Italy, where in Sicilian culture is particularly individualistic, making such a collective process of social learning difficult. However, loyalty to the enterprise is an asset as workers frequently want to continue working in their firms, even in times of crisis. One of the main challenges, argues Gaetano, is convincing workers to embrace the new firm type. Frequently, there is no interest in participating in particular decision-making processes. The switch in culture was most readily internalized by inspettori or managers. Sal Pietro suggested that, that what wound up convincing many of the workers of the new model was the hope of a dividend. In the end, the combination of this hope and at the same time, the ease with which people can continue to work what they know, uh, convinced many to stay during the difficult period of transition. At the same time, Gaetano suggested that banks are often more willing to support financing projects uh, where they are, there's a high degree of passion. In the case of Centro Olimpio, it was not easy to access credit since the region is poor. Moreover, frequently business succession plans, uh, such as the one developed by Centro Olimpio, are not accepted by banks. Moreover, there was a lack of interest on the part of old management to support the project. In total, uh, the workers were able to raise 2 million euros from the client base GFI and from the credit market. Asked whether the workers would consider a multi-stakeholder model, Gaetano Salpietro responded that the scale of the operation is too small, that the idea is good in theory, but difficult to implement in practice, considering the differing interests. Moreover, the consumer cooperative model is underdeveloped in the Mezzo Giorno or in the south of Italy, where worker cooperatives are relatively more common. So it does appear that region, relational governance can contribute to a shift in values, but that such a shift is not automatic. As Fran Eiler argued, you have to change the mind first, then the business. And this involves the type of cooperative education discussed above in the case of Lein, a traveling university. Concerning Eroski's failed attempt to incorporate non-cooperative locations into the multi-stakeholder model, we can also conclude that a delicate process of social learning, emphasis on tangible mind milestones along the path of self-efficacy would facilitate a longer-term shift in the perceptions of workers at currently non-cooperative locations. One must recall the observation made by the Caya Laboral Popular, Mondragon's investment arm, that concluded it is cheaper usually to establish new firms than to convert existing translative to inalienable hierarchies. However, understanding more the relations between innovation, investment, and social sustainability, respectively, the inclusion or the incursion of regimes into firms and the often complementary interactions between formal and informal organizational and individual values can help facilitate 
simplifying the process of conversion, a topic which uh, I do return to in the latter part of this uh, module. Moreover, while traditional investor-owned business can benefit from relational governance, it would appear that a cooperative form requires it, or as the above example clearly show, uh, flourish, uh, flourishes with relational approaches to governing. As such, it can be costly, very costly for a relational culture to reintroduce principal agent mechanisms like professionalized managers, outsourcing of certain functions, reductions in volunteerism, etc. This should emphasize the importance of maintaining an inclusive stakeholder dialogue at all points in an organization's life cycle. Such reforms, if badly implemented, can deeply compromise the foundations of shared value creation and can facilitate what Friedrich Nietzsche once referred to as ressentiment. It must be recalled that a logic of cooperation comes with both additional costs as well as benefits. To take an example from the above, the example of Sladyana Nikolic's colleague's bathroom break and the subsequent bureaucratic process of investigation stands in sharp contrast to Iroski's intra sin llamar policy. This is an example where the legal and formal institutional structures together with organizational values promote a governance style that we have referred to in, in preceding uh, videos and lectures as inalienable hierarchy. Of course, such a style also entails its own costs, which uh, the learning process at both Centro Olimpio and Iroski attest to. The need for change in mentality, which can come about through social learning or be promulgated by crisis, such as in Centro Olimpio, is a requirement for cooperative rent to accrue. This can also be seen in the stated occurrence of a worker opportunist, opportunistically abusing their sick leave, as was observed at Rewe. If there is no change in culture after the transfer into an inalienable hierarchy or the introduction of democratic choice mechanisms, then this type of behavior, what economists refer to as moral hazard, is likely to continue. On the other end of things, there is the need to promote social investments that extend the duration of cooperation. This involves the recognition of the need for holistic stakeholder dialogue that reduces the risk of perceiving policies as illegitimate. Thus, Greenstar's problem of importing principal agent policies entails the cost of reducing investment of time in volunteering on the part of members, which should encourage the cooperative to consider if any increased efficiencies gained by importing professional managers are outweighed by the loss of the effectiveness of the organization due to divestment and the shrinking cooperation, cooperation corridor. Cooperatives need to realize the extent to which market forces constrain the operations and governance of a firm. To the extent that they do, the distribution of risks or costs and benefits, such as rents, must be carried out in a way that recognizes the contribution of all stakeholders, both internal and external, to shared value creation. Bicameralism, consensus, or some combination of DCMs, that is, democratic choice mechanisms, can provide the necessary instruments to this effect. There's also a need to limit the relevant constituencies the cooperative serves. Thus, uh, according to Dan Hoffman, if you serve a broader and broader constituency, then you start to lose out the appeal to purists. A Green Star worker stated in conclusion that uh, I would love to see Green Star get back to do, doing something that felt like less of a hierarchy and less like we're going in a corporate direction and more all staff meetings and in ways to be heard and make decisions together. In closing, we should emphasize the benefits of relational contracts, broad grooming of the workforce for management and other aspects of relational governance like that can be seen in the Arismendi bakeries in the United States in their potential contributions to such a transformation. What is clear from the above case studies is that where workers can secure binding commitments, the willingness to cooperate increases uh, all things uh, given. This connection between the psychological and economic logics mediated by logic of cooperation must be explicitly exploited by cooperatives. The principles and guidance notes can provide support in applying these in diverging contexts In the next video, I go into social entrepreneurship versus entrepreneurial dependence in the rideshare and delivery sector. See you there.